Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your house. Go to ring.com slash know how and get up to $150 off a Ring of Security Kit. And by WordPress. Plans start at just $4 a month. Get 15% off your brand new website today at wordpress.com slash know how. Today on Know How, we'll show you how to shut your pie hole. We're going to take a Raspberry Pi and use it to block ads. Welcome to Know How. It's a Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I am Father Robert Palliser. And I'm Patrick Delahanty. And for the next however many minutes it takes, we're going to be opening up your knowledge hole and putting in a pie hole so you're going to have hole-on-hole -hole action. That doesn't sound right. Yeah, no, okay. No. <laughs> now, Patrick, you, you were supposed to be on last week's episode, but you ended up going down to... I was uh, at BlizzCon. How was that? Oh, it was so much fun. It's one of my favorite conventions. Uh, it's a convention focused solely on Blizzard Entertainment. They've got StarCraft, World of Warcraft, uh, Diablo, Overwatch, Heroes of the Storm, and Hearthstone. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting because this is sort of a trend not just for the gaming industry, but pretty much for the entire tech industry. It used to be that you had some big conferences like Comdex or CES, mm. and that's where everyone would come to show off their stuff. And recently, you've had tech companies start to say, hey, wait a minute, for the money I spend to go to CES, why don't I just do my own thing? Yeah, and so BlizzCon had over 30,000 people there Jeez. over two days, folk, and they made announcements. Uh, there was a Muse concert. There were demos by uh, tech companies, and it, they had lots of tournaments, too. So you could see the world champion of Overwatch and StarCraft. And, and, and I know that they do a lot of cosplay, which I love. Yes. I, I know Bill Doran, Chinbeard, he brought the pro. He created a probe from Yeah, he uh, made the from Probius Overwatch. from uh, Heroes of the Storm. Oh, Heroes of the Storm, Which yeah. is based off that of thing uh, awesome. StarCraft. <laughs> and he donated to Blizzard. He brought he it down. He donated it? He made it out of oh. foam. It was powered with a little remote control car underneath. And they brought it down. He and his wife brought it in uh, four suitcases. <laughs> and it came apart, and they had it in four suitcases, and they didn't want to have to bring it home, so they donated it to Blizzard, so the Heroes of the Storm team has it. Oh, and man. my cousin's on that team, so she uh, tweeted yesterday, like, hey, the probe has arrived. So. That's, that's very cool. Now, that's cool content, but we're not here to talk yeah. about conventions. We're not even here to talk uh, about Probius. <laughs> Although it's kind of cool, maybe that'll be another day, exactly. Yes. But what we are here to talk about are ads. Now, okay... Oh. That's Folks, so this is a touchy subject for us because we are an ad-supported network. It's how we make our living. It's how we continue bringing content. However, I totally hear you, and I understand when people say, I wish there was a way to block annoying ads because some pages just go way overboard. Yeah, and I think I'm like most people when I browse the web, I can kind of ignore most of the ads that I see on the site. I, I, they're just over on the right or at the bottom, and I, yeah, they're there. I don't pay any attention to them. But then there's the ones that come yeah. up and pop up, and they're flashy. and Yeah, so I want yeah. those to go away. And it's also a bit of a security problem because when the ad-serving networks aren't paying attention, oh, every once yeah. in a while they serve up a malicious ad, and then and suddenly your computer's doing things it shouldn't be doing. And again, that's not a FUD thing. It's actually happened. Very oh, slim yeah. chance of it happening, but when it does happen, it's incredibly annoying. Yeah, I used to work for Monster.com in the ad support department, and every now and then, we'd have to track down some sort of malicious ad that was serving malware. And when the ad was sold and scheduled, it looked fine, but they made yeah, it they so that like, every yep. 10,000 times it shows up. Now we do this terrible thing. And so those are really hard to track down. Right, right. So uh, we're, we're not saying that you should do this project that we're, we're going to be giving to you, but we're saying that this is definitely a possibility. Now, there are ad blocking solutions out there right now. There are a couple that run on your PC, that run on the clients. Uh, there are other ways to do what we're suggesting you do with our pie hole using something like the Windows host file, where you can essentially take over the functions of DNS and 
and, and black hole any traffic that's supposed to be going to the ad serving networks. Right. But what we wanted to do was to use an open source project that is 100% free, except of course from the hardware you have to buy, that would automatically update as the ad serving networks change their domains and subdomains. You know this, this is a cat and mouse game. Yeah. They understand that people are blocking their domain, so what they'll do is they'll add another subdomain or a new yeah. domain or, or dozens of them. Yeah, at Monster we used to have ads.monster.com and we found that there were some ad blockers that would block it just because ads was the subdomain. So when we put in a new ad server, we renamed it to oas.monster.com. Right. I don't think they're using that one anymore either. No, no. So. Now, uh, for this project, this is actually, the reason why it took so long for us to do this is this is not much. Actually, this is super, super simple. You're not going to need much. You need a Raspberry Pi and you need an SD card. Now, I've got links in the show notes. The first is for the Raspberry Pi 3B. This is the newest currently. You're going to pay about $35 for this. You probably have a couple of Raspberries lying around. I would not do this project on a Raspberry Pi 1 maybe on a Raspberry Pi 2B, but the faster it is, the better you're going to get it. Because remember, what we're doing is we're actually creating a new DNS system, a new DNS server. We'll explain what that means in just a bit. And if you've got a slow response time, it slows everything down, and that's no bueno. You also may want to get yourself a little case. Um, I've, I was going to 3D print a bunch of stuff, but I decided to make this episode completely 3D printing free. So <laughs> all a first. Yeah, that's a first. <laughs> uh, now, an SD card is going to cost you like 10 bucks. The Raspberry is going to cost you $35. This will cost you, what, 5 bucks. So this is, you know, you're looking at a $50 project, but what you're going to get out of this is pretty spectacular. Now, I don't want to tell you. I actually want to show you. What we've got here is two computers. Mine is a Windows box. Patrick's is a Mac. Uh, they're both set up to go through our old uh, little uh, router. Uh, our, what is this? I think it, uh, the, the 24 oh. something, WRT 2454G, whatever. The Linksys router that you've seen on the show many, many times. But we're also using this. This is the pie hole that we've set up. So this one's already good to go. It's, uh, it, and you'll see how we set this up. This is acting as a DNS server only for Patrick's machine. Mine is bypassing it. Now, here's what we're going to do. If you go ahead, Patrick, and jump over to. Um, Hard OCP. This is one of my favorite enthusiast sites, uh, and uh, you know it's it's run by Kyle Bennett. Exact same time, hmm. two different computers. Hey Patrick, go and scroll down. You notice something different about us? Our screens here. Hmm. Maybe it's uh, some missing ads on yeah. yours. Yeah. I'm so, not seeing all this great content. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Hard OCP is actually pretty good because all of their ads are related to what they cover, which I kind of like. But let's try a different one. Why don't you try to go to um, uh, YouTube? No, 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 no. Uh, go to, what was the one that you suggested before? Forbes? Well, let's go to Forbes. Yeah, they always have that pop-up that comes up. There we go. So right. if, if I scroll oh, yeah, down. I don't, I don't have the ad on the top that yep. went away. See, there we go. So uh, this is all this is doing is this is black holding the DNS request. So when I go to a page like this, there are third party requests. So it's not from Forbes.com, it's from like AdClick or Google Ads. And that has to be a DNS query. So the page is querying from multiple DNS entries. When it sees one that is contained within the database of ad serving domains, it just black holes it, it just goes nowhere. And so what happens is you end up with a blank spot in your page. And actually, we have to do this one because you know it's only fair, go to Twit TV. So when we go to Twit TV, there's not much. We don't, we don't like to overload our audience with ads. So there's like this one down below, and what do you have? Yeah, nothing. yours is empty. I got nothing, Right. because Twit's ads are served through uh, double click. Right. Now, there is one drawback to this approach, and that is some of these vendors and some of these content providers are getting a little wise, and so what they're going to do is they're going to serve what's called native ads. If it comes off the domain that the content is coming off of, there's no really good way to block it, uh, because to block that domain is to also block the content that you want in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. You, you actually saw this at Monster, right? Yeah, and that's why we changed it to use uh, oas.monster because it didn't look like an ad domain, and if it's not in the uh, blacklist in this device, then, well, the ads keep serving. Right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what's actually happening here. So now that you've seen it, and hopefully you, you want to try this for yourself, let's explain what it can and cannot do. Some people are saying, oh, it's stripping ads out of the pages. That's not technically true. It's not stripping the ads. The ads just never get downloaded in the first place. 
because of DNS. Now, DNS is the no domain name system. Uh, Patrick, you, you understand how DNS works, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, this is a core technology of the internet. Essentially, the internet runs on numbers, either IPv4 or IPv6. But when it's running on numbers, I need some sort of way to actually get to those numbers. I need a way to turn CNN.com or Forbes.com into the actual numeric equivalent so that I can route traffic to the right place. That's what DNS does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have seen in the past, over the last summer, what happens when the DNS system is taken down. If it's taken down, if you have a host file that has been that you've set up for your favorite site, you can still get to your sites. If you know the numeric equivalents, you can just type that into your browser and get to that. But if DNS is down itself, it won't do what's called resolution. It won't resolve domain names into the IP addresses and therefore not work. And the host file is really just your own local DNS right. system. Right, right. It's it's overriding whatever the, the, the DNS server you normally use is supposed to be saying and using your own settings. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, I do like this approach, however, rather than stripping out ads because it means that the ads were never downloaded in the first place. Yes. Uh, if you are on a bandwidth limited system, this is quite good because some of those ads, especially the, the more malicious ones, yeah. can take up a lot of space and can hammer the connection pretty continuously. So if it's not even allowing you to access those servers, it's not even talking to the ad serving servers, that's at least a little bit of communication that doesn't have to happen. Uh, Patrick, before we dump in, uh, dive into this, I think let's do a quick recap on how the actual underlying technology works because it's one thing to say that this is working on DNS it's another thing to explain why that actually works yeah okay so when we're talking about the internet uh, let's say Patrick is a router on the East Coast and I'm a router on the West Coast and East Coast routers are much taller than West Coast yes. routers but West Coast routers are much um, they contain more uh, but so in order for me to talk to him there's probably a couple of dozen nodes routers in between and what will happen is a a piece of traffic that uh, is generated on my network that is destined for his network will jump from router to router to router to router, each one not knowing the exact location of his router, of his network, but getting closer and closer and closer until finally it finds it and once it becomes, uh, it, once it reaches his router, it gets push to the right client. It's kind of like asking for directions and the guy says, oh yeah, it's that way. Yeah, and you ask the next person, oh, it's over that way. It's, it's excessive approximation. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not a flaw. That's actually how the internet was designed to work. That's why it can route redundantly around damaged parts of the internet. Because every router is aware of what it's connected to. And if this link suddenly goes down, it'll say, well, I don't have a direct connection to that, but maybe I can route it in this direction. And maybe he'll be able to route it around the, the damaged section of the network. That's what, how it works, and it's actually kind of wonderful. A lot of people compare it to a switch, which is kind of true, but not really. So when we're dealing with a switch, and if you, if you want to know about, uh, more about this, go to episode 291, because we did a, the incomplete switch and router uh, rundown. In a switch, I have a memory table. So I have uh, uh, bits of memory inside the, uh, the switch that have memorized all the MAC addresses. Those are the physical addresses of the devices on my network. And so anytime I get a frame addressed to a particular device, the switches all know, hey, that's, that switch is on this port. That, uh, that MAC is on this port. That MAC is on that port. That MAC is on that port. And it kind of routes it, but every switch knows where every device is. Problem is, if you try to do that on the internet, you need an infinite amount of memory because it is—it's a huge number of devices. You would never be able to run unless, unless you you had like the supercomputer of all switches. You you, you couldn't do it. You, yeah. There's there's just too much there. So rather than memorizing where every device is, it's kind of memorizing the routes, the locations. Uh, so I let let's say I ask for 10.50.40.62. I may not know where that is, but I know that the 10.50 networks are in this direction. Yeah. And so I'll shoot it off in that direction, and hopefully that router will know more as it hits that, that node, and the next node, and the next node, and finally arriving at its installation. Well, it's just like the physical mail. It will say the city and state, and they can route it there, and then from there they know the physical address that you're trying to mail the thing to. Right, right. So. Uh, one other bit when we're doing this, uh, because we will be talking about IPv4 and IPv6, uh, hopefully, most of you realize that we have hit IPv4 exhaustion. I loved IPv4 because I could memorize all of the servers that I needed because it was just four octets. Yeah. It was uh, four 8-bit uh, values. 
because IPv4 is a 32-bit addressing scheme, which means there's approximately 4.3 billion possible unique combinations, less because some of those are, rever are reserved. Well, we hit that. Uh, we have way more than 4.3 billion devices that are connected to the internet right now, and so we've moved over to IPv6. Now, people have asked me if we will run out of IPv6 addresses eventually. Um, no. Uh, and, well, and, if we do, it's not our problem. Well, no, I mean... It's going to be long after we're gone. It's, uh, <laughs> no, this is one of those, you could address every molecule in the universe um, yeah, and well, not run out of IPv6 like, addresses. Like I said, not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just remember, think about how, how it works. Every time you go up a bit, it's going to raise it to the power of two. So IPv4 is 32-bit. IPv6 is 128-bit. It's ridiculous. Uh, we will never use all those, even though there are huge chunks of IPv6 that are reserved and will never be used for anything, we will never need IPv7. Uh, if we do need IPv7, it means that we're addressing subatomic particles, and uh, yeah, we're probably not going to do that. Yeah, you I never know. know. Who knows? Who knows? All right, so we've got routers versus switches. We've got IPv6 versus IPv4. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the difference between, say, this router and the routers that we were talking about on the, uh, on the Internet, so how we move from, from router to router, node to node. They're essentially going to do the same functions. Uh, you're going to use a switch anytime you're inside of a network. You're going to use a router anytime you're going between networks. This little router here, even though it's what, 20 years old and <laughs> barely, barely functioning, it will allow me to route packet packets from one network to another. Now, in a, a typical end user router like this, I'm going to have four functions. I'm going to have the router, so that just routes packets between two networks. I'm going to have the NAT, the network address translation layer, which allows me to take one real world address and turn it into multiple internal addresses. And that's why I can have 255 uh, devices on my internal network, but to the outside world it only looks like one. I'm going to have a firewall, which is just a fancy way of saying I'm going to stop people from the outside from seeing stuff that's on the inside. And then I have DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol. That's what I'm going to take advantage of when we start to do the Pi-hole project. You ready to jump into this? Yeah, let's go. Okay. Well, before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank a sponsor of this episode of Know How. Hey, Patrick, have you, uh, have you seen this before? Yes. Yeah, this is our... Those are uh, awesome. This is, this is part of the Ring family. Now, we've had Ring on the network for quite a while, so hopefully you know what they are. It, quite simply, they're a way to protect your home. They're a way to make sure that things are good. They started with the Ring Video Doorbell, which was a fantastic product. In fact, it's something that I bought for my family in Las Vegas because I was a little worried about my parents. I, I wanted to make sure that there weren't going to be strange random break-ins. I wanted to make sure that people weren't stealing packages off of their front porch. And so I installed a Ring Video Doorbell with my dad, and I, I gotta tell you, it's probably the best purchase I've ever made for that house. It's motion activated, so it automatically tells you when something comes within range of the camera. It also offers two-way audio, so not, not only can I see the people who might be on the porch, but I can talk to them, and they can talk to me. And the best thing about it is it connects to my mobile devices, to my phones, to my tablets, so that even when I'm away, I'm always home. Well, they've upped their game with the Ring of Security. A Ring is, their mission is to make neighborhoods safer. And today, over a million people use the amazing Ring video doorbell to help protect their homes. Ring knows that home security begins at the front door, but it doesn't end there. That's why they're extending that same level of security that I had with the Ring Video Doorbell to the rest of your home with the Ring Floodlight Cam. Now, just like Ring's Video Doorbell, Floodlight Cam is a motion-activated camera and floodlight that connects to your phone. With HD video and two-way audio, it lets you know the moment anyone steps on your property. That means that you can see and speak to visitors, even set off an alarm, right for your phone. Now, with Ring's Floodlight Cam, when things go bump in the night, you'll immediately know what it is and you can bump back whether you're home or away, the Ring Floodlight Cam lets you keep an eye on your home. Ring's Floodlight Cams offer the ultimate in home security with high visibility floodlights and a powerful HD camera that puts security in your hands. It was named the Wall Street Journal's best of CES 2017, and it's not hard to see why. You can monitor every corner of your property with a Ring of Security Kit, and all those kits include a Ring Video Doorbell and your choice of either one, two, or three floodlight cams. Connect your Ring Video Doorbell with your favorite smart locks and hubs for added convenience, monitoring, and security. With Ring, you're always home.
And right now you can save up to $150 off a Ring of Security Kit when you go to ring.com slash knowhow. That's ring.com slash knowhow. And we thank Ring for their support of knowhow. Okay, Patrick, so let's get back into it. We just talked a little bit about the basic functions. I want to go over it a little bit more. Mm. Uh, let's talk about NAT, and I'm just recapping again episode 291, but it's important for you to understand what's going on inside your network, so when then you start changing things, you actually understand what you've changed. We're not changing NAT. NAT, as I mentioned, is a way to, say, to make all the devices inside your network fit under one real-world device. You actually only need one routable address. That's important, that, that word routable. You need one routable address on your network so that traffic on the internet has a way to come back to you, right? It used to be, back in the old day, every device I had had a real world address, which means yeah. every device I had could be pinged by every other device on the internet. It was, it was fun because back in those days we didn't really worry about security. It was just kind of cool, look, I can see my phone from my computer. Uh, nowadays we would consider that, um, what's the word? Uh, stupid, yeah, that would be really <laughs> stupid. We don't want that. NAT allows me to take that one real world address and route traffic for everything behind it. Yeah. Yeah. So I have my phone, my laptop, my, uh, my Roku, my Apple TV. They all go through my router and to the outside world it looks like it's coming from one device. But the router itself knows that when that traffic comes back, well, this, this stream goes to that, that connection goes to this, this port goes to that. Right. Right. Okay. When uh, the firewall, that's basically the ability to, to own, uh, turn services on and off. So if you've ever wanted to run a server behind your router, you will have to understand the firewall settings because you're going to route traffic coming in on a particular port to a particular device. Uh, there's also wireless, uh, but of course I've turned it off on this one. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna talk about DHCP because this is where it gets important. Again, back in the day, uh, I'm not sure if you remember this, but it used to be we didn't have DHCP, Dynamic Host Control right. Protocol. Yeah. We had to have a chart and I literally had a notepad that had all the IP addresses that were in my network, and next to it was the MAC address and, uh, and then the device name. And the reason why we had to, to do that is because we had to manually enter in the, I, the addresses of all the, vi the devices that we wanted to work on a network. The problem with that is, of course, well, that paper only exists on my pad. If I ever lose it, I've lost my records. And you can't have two devices on the same network address. So mm -hmm. once my network started getting big, there was always a possibility that I could reassign a number that was already in use. You, right. Did you ever have to do that at months? Probably not. You were already no. in the DHCP age. Yeah, we had DHCP then. But I, I did have to... I remember before DNS was there and you had to actually put in the, the bang between the, the server addresses. Right, right. Yeah, so. uh, actually, uh, we, we do have a, a comment from Keith512 in the chat room. And I, actually, I'm with you on this one, Keith. IPv6 is great because I'm never going to run out of space. And I actually have a block of IPv6 addresses that were given to me. But I will never be able to memorize an IPv6 address. Oh, yeah. Uh, For copying and pasting. Yeah. They're uh, well, long uh, and complicated. You got to remember this. Uh, so IPv4 is 8 by 4 hexadecimal. Uh, oh no, IPv6 uh, is 8 by 4 hexadecimal uh, characters. So it'd be like A, 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 B, 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 and just do that eight times. Yeah. Um, I'm never memorizing that. I could memorize that. Well, maybe if it was A-A-A-A-B-B-B. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can do that once. Yeah. Okay. All right, but let's get back to DHCP. So the way that DHCP works is when a client first connects to a network, it's going to send a discovery packet. This is a broadcast packet, which means it goes, it's going to hit every device on the network. It's going to say, hey, I'm new in the neighborhood. I would like some information here about what I'm connected to and what my resources are. It's called a DHCP discover packet. Then... The gateway, the DHCP server, that's typically the same thing on, on a home router, is going to do what's called an offer. It's going to send a DHCP offer packet. And in that DHCP offer packet, you have a couple of pieces of information. You've got um, the client's MAC address. You've got the subnet mask. You've got the IP address. You've got the lease duration. You've got the gateway. And you've got the DNS server. Those are the pieces of information that the client needs to be able to speak properly with the network. Now that client is going to make a request. It's going to say, oh, okay, so you're in charge of this. This is what I'd like. It's going to send a D another DHCP request packet, and then it's going to get an acknowledgement from the DHCP server saying, yes, that's yours for this long, and contact me again in, in whatever, six hours, 30 minutes, and ask for another uh, address. So that's how DHCP works. And th the wonderful thing about that is it's automatic. 
all modern devices are set by default to DHCP. So whenever they connect to a network, they will automatically get their network information. We're going to take advantage of that to help you set up your pie hole. So, um, hey, Patrick, want to do some pie holing? Yes, put some stuff in my pie hole. Without further ado, hey, Alex, go ahead and push that magic button. Creating your own pie hole is a beginner's level Raspberry Pi project that you can have complete within 30 minutes, as long as you have basic computing knowledge. The first step is to get your favorite distro. I use the latest version of Raspbian Stretch straight from the Raspberry Pi website. Once you've downloaded your image, go ahead and get an SD imaging program like Win32 Disk Imager or Etcher. These programs will allow you to write the image to an SD card without even unzipping the download. The duration of the imaging process will depend on the speed of the card and the writer, but make sure to allow the imaging software to verify the write once it's done. You don't want a corrupt distro to halt your pie hole groove. Once image, insert the card into your Raspi, connect network, keyboard, mouse, and display, then power it up. After the initial setup, you should be dropped into the desktop. Open a command shell, then type the following command. C-U-R-L space dash s uppercase s uppercase l space https colon forward slash forward slash install dot pi dash hole dot net space pipe space b a s h and hit enter assuming that you're properly connected to a network this will launch a script that will automatically install Pi Hole onto your Raspi. On a Raspi 3, assuming a broadband connection, installing the packages should take between 2 and 5 minutes. If you're a bit more experienced and curious about how Pi Hole actually works, this would be a good time to look through the code, which is completely open. If you're not, just sit back and wait until you get the welcome screen, along with a warning that the installer is about to transform your Raspi into an ad-blocking network device. Hit the spacebar to continue, then space through the following info screens until you get to the Choose an Interface screen. This will allow you to choose from any network interface that are available on your Pi. If you're using a 3, you have both wired and wireless options. However, if at all possible, choose wired because the last thing you want to do is to add any instability or latency to your DNS. Next, you're asked to choose your upstream DNS provider. This is the DNS service that your Pi Hole will use to obtain DNS results before filtering out the requests to domains that serve ads. I suggest that you use Google 8.8.8.8 as their service is fast and the least likely to go down. The next screen allows you to select the protocols that your Pi Hole will use to block ads. Make sure that both IPv4 and IPv6 are selected, then space through. Next, you'll be asked to set a static address. This is important. Most of our devices use DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol, to be assigned an address, gateway, lease time, and DNS. We don't want that on our pie hole because DHCP addresses can change over time, and if it changes after we've set our clients to use it, then we won't be able to resolve any domains. What I would suggest is that you use an address outside of the scope reserved by your router's DHCP server. If you allow it to use your current network address, there's a chance that another device will be assigned to that address in the future and that will also kill DNS. The following screen should all be left at default. Install and turn on the web admin interface, then allow your Pi Hole to log all your queries, unless you don't have complete control over the space in which you'll install your Pi Hole and are worried about others seeing your DNS queries. At this point, you're done, at least with the setup on the Raspi. If you've changed your network settings, you may have to restart the Pi, but your Pi Hole should now be active on your configured address. Before the ad blocking will work, you'll need to either configure each client to use the Pi Hole as its DNS server, or else change the settings in the router itself so that new DHCP requests are automatically given the address of the Pi Hole. Once that's set up, you'll go from ad ridden to ad barren. So, Patrick, what this has done is we now have the Pi Hole set up, but just plugged into your network, it's it's not actually going to do anything. You need to yeah. take advantage of the stuff that we just talked about with DHCP uh, in order to either manually or automatically direct computers to use that as their DNS server. We're going to do that in, in just a bit. Uh, but you know what I want to do first? What? I, I want to take a moment 
to thank another sponsor of this episode of Noah. Hey, hey, Patrick, have you ever heard of the uh, of the maxim location, location, location? Yeah, it's essential to a business. Yeah, I mean, because if you've got the greatest business ever, but you're located under a freeway overpass and there's no way to get to you, it's no. probably not going to do so well. No. Yeah. What what you need is you need a way to to take your project, to take your online persona to take your content and put it in a place where people will actually find it a name that people will remember a, a, a way to to show the world that you understand that location 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 is just as valid in the digital realm as it is in the real world and that's why we are so happy to have wordpress as a sponsor of know-how you see they get all that they understand location they understand content they understand that maybe you're not the best programmer but you do want to show off what you have and they will give you the real estate they will give you the location and they will give you the style and design you need to present your best foot that's what wordpress does well, we use WordPress.com every day, and let me tell you, whether you're looking to create a personal blog, a business site, or both, creating your website at WordPress.com helps others find you, remember you, and connect with you. You don't need experience. You don't need to hire someone. WordPress.com guides you through the entire process from start to finish. They take care of the technical side, so it's easy to get your site up and running. They have hundreds of beautiful designs to choose from. You'll get built-in search engine optimization and social sharing. Their business plan lets you access hundreds of plugins and themes. Their customer support team is made up of WordPress experts eager to help you with the get the most out of your site. And they're available to help 24 hours a day, Monday through Friday, and weekends too. Not only that, but their plans start at just $4 per month. Come and see why 28% of all websites run on WordPress. You can get started today with 15% off any new plan purchase. Just go to wordpress.com slash knowhow. That's wordpress.com slash knowhow to create your website and find the plan that's right for you. Again, that's wordpress.com slash knowhow. And for 15% off your brand new website, do it now. And we thank WordPress for their support of knowhow. Okay, Patrick, so we've got our uh, pie hole running. It's, it's up, it's, it's running on, uh, on our Raspberry Pi, which by the way, it will work on pretty much any distribution of Linux. I just like it on a Raspi because it's nice and small and I can put it in the back of my data closet and forget it. Here's the thing though, unless my computer, my client, is actually using the Pi hole to do its DNS, mm -hmm. it doesn't do anything. It just sits there and, and yeah. looks pretty. What I need to do is I need to reassign the DNS that remember that because that's part of the DHCP offer right DHCP right. gives me my gateway it gives me my address my lease time my subnet my DNS uh, so I need to change the DNS without changing the gateway there's a couple of different ways to do this I'm going to show you one right now if you go to my computer Alex uh, this is a the manual way to do it so let's go to this and this allows me to actually change manually the settings on my computer. I'm only going to do IPv4 because inside my network there's no real need for IPv6, not, not just yet. Uh, but this is all obtained automatically. That's, what, that's why it's uh, checked here, obtain an IP address automatically. I'm going to do this instead. Use the following DNS server, and I already set it up for 192.168.10.253. I have just told my client to go to that server, which is my, my pie hole, anytime it has a DNS resolution that it wants to, to, to resolve. Now, what I'll also do is because there might be a, a, a moment where my Pi server has died or it got unplugged or it's, it's unavailable, I'll also add a different a secondary DNS server. So I'm going to put 8.8.8.8. Now, that's only going to work. It's only going to go there if the, uh, the Pi hole for any reason is unavailable. Uh, but the cool thing about that, it means that even if it does go down, I'm not going to lose internet access. I mean, I'm not going to lose the ability to resolve a name. Uh, you could do this for every device on your network, but that becomes a pain. So uh, can you think of any other way we would do that? Uh, change the router to use that as DNS. Precisely. Good yeah. call, Patrick. So <laughs> in our router, let's go and go to this screen. In our router, this, again, this is DDWRT. You can use whatever interface you have. Every single one of them, however, has the ability to offer specific settings to my uh, to the clients. So this is the the DHCP server. It's enabled right now. Um, I know that it's going to start at 100, 
So it's going to start offering addresses at 192.168.10.100. I know it, it will, uh, uh, let's see, does this actually offer me, uh, 50. So it'll go all the way up to uh, 192.168.10.149. But here, I can actually set what DNS server is going to be offered to a client that requests an address from the DHCP server. So I could put 192.168.168.10.100. Dot 10, dot 253. And so by doing that, by putting this here, it means that any new client that connects to my network is automatically going to be given this gateway and that DNS server. So if it's an iPhone or Android, somebody's tablet, Doesn't they're matter. all going through here. Doesn't so, matter. Yep. Yeah, because you can't put an ad blocker in an iPhone. Right. So you <laughs> so have so. to, this is the, really the only way to do it. Yeah, yeah, DNS blocking. Yeah. Uh, now, I will say this. Uh, if if you make the change, it won't affect devices already connected to the network until their lease expires. So the way that DHCP works is periodically, and you get this actually, go back to my, uh, my computer, uh, every 1,440 minutes on this router, it's going to demand that the client request another address. Uh, the problem is, if I change anything, it's going to be 1,440 minutes minus well, how much time has elapsed before it will, change, it will take the new settings. Uh, in that particular case, what you can do is drop the DHCP address and then, and then reload it. In, in Windows, that's actually kind of easy. I would just do this, IP config release, and then IP config renew. Uh, and it will drop the DHCP yeah. address and then it will get the new settings. And in Mac OS, there's a button to renew the lease. Precisely, so. yeah. So just, just know that. This is, I, I like doing this because it, it means that anyone logging into my network will automatically get the benefits of my pie hole, but Patrick, you brought up during the break that there's there are a couple downsides of doing this. Yeah, uh, I was checking some sites and they're really slow to load, yep. some of them. Uh, yep. CNN took a long time to come yes. up and so did StarWars.com. And uh, other sites may not look right without the ads in there because some ads will collapse when they're not displayed and as a result, the page looks kind of weird. Uh, MSNBC had some overlap mm -hmm. on some of their content. Uh, and also, you may want to actually have ads display on a site because you like that site and you, you want to support, support them, them and let them have whatever meager ad income they can get. Yeah, that, That's one of the drawbacks to this kind of an, an approach, which is, is it's kind of an all or nothing thing. I mean, yeah, I can change it. I, I, I can manually change my DHCP, I mean, my DNS server back to something that's not going to block out ad domains, but I have to do that every time by going into the settings that I just showed you. That's where a software ad blocker might actually work yeah. a little bit better because you can turn it on and off with just a button on the browser. And you can whitelist certain sites. Precisely. You, uh, this is no, uh, not quite yet. Now, there, there is something else I do want to show you. This does have a pretty cool interface. So this is the Raspberry Pi right now. It will show you how many queries it's blocked. It will show you how many uh, you know, different domains have been blocked. This, this has only been in existence for a couple of hours now, but you can already see that Google Analytics is leading uh, the charge. That's the one that's blocked most often, followed by, oh, well, let's, let's zoom so in So it here. even blocks Google Analytics. It does. So I'm not gonna be able to tell who's looking at my site. Yeah, I, actually, if, you're, if you uh, use Google Analytics, uh, you can't log in to Google Analytics oh, when this is enabled. Whoops. You also can't log into Twitter Analytics or Facebook Analytics because those are all blocked. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's kind of oops, oopsie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is this is interesting. I, I kind of want to put this on the school network. Oh. Just <laughs> see how many. But but as you mentioned, this slows it down because folks, you are adding an extra device. Yeah. So this this is not a true DNS server. This is a pass through DNS server. It's actually getting its DNS results from Google. So whenever you request a DNS resolution, you go to the pie hole. Then the pie hole asks Google, then it comes back to you and gives you the DNS resolution for, for domains it's not blocking. Uh, that's that's going to add latency. Just just know that. Just know that. Yeah. So what do you think? Uh, is it something that you would, I mean, it's super easy. This, this is oh, a, yeah, it's easy. It's an installation that will literally take you 30 minutes. I think maybe if we can put some sort of motion sensor in here into the Raspberry Pi, so when I wave, or when I do something, then it activates, and then I block the ads, and then I can wave again, and then it turns out. You know, something that I was thinking about doing that is, but I think I'm going to run out of, out of horsepower. Um, I can combine this with the project we did for the Tor router. 
So uh, it will be a Tor router that also block ad, blocks ads, which is good because if I'm going through Tor, I'm yeah, already going to be yeah. bandwidth limited. And it will also be a hotspot. If, if that's the case, then this would be a cool device to use when I'm on the road uh, and I'm, yeah. I'm bandwidth limited. And if you can also redirect the ads to an image so they're all replaced with some little... Corgi that's, yeah, image that's just IP happy table. face. Yeah. yeah, if, you can, okay. yeah if, if you know IP <laughs> tables, you can basically redirect anything that you want. But, and, and again, this is not new. You can do this on Windows. You can do this in Mac. You can have your own host file. Yeah. But the difference is, Alex, if you go back to my computer, is the fact that this is automatically maintained by the Pi Hole project folks. So right now they're drop, they're, they are blocking 100,993 domains and subdomains. They update that. Which, by the way, if you use this project, do me a favor and donate to them because they don't monetize this. They don't, there's no advertising on the pie hole. They don't sell the software. They don't sell hardware. So the only way they keep the project going is if you donate. I actually tossed in 10 bucks last night um, you know, just to be a mm. good internet citizen. So still, for all its drawbacks, if you have a Raspi 2 sitting around or maybe even a Raspi 3, this is a very cool project that's incredibly quick to do Mm. that you can start playing with to see if, uh, if you want to get some ad-blocking bliss. Anything else, yeah. Mr. Monster Ad Guy? Uh, yeah, don't block ads on my site. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it pays for pizza. I, I, I have to say, it does change your perspective on the problem when you create content and you go, wait, don't block my ads. Yeah. Wait, you're, you're, well, you're see, cool, that's, right? And that's why I don't personally use ad blockers, although yeah. there are some sites where it's like, I just yeah. want to block that ad. Yeah. I, you know, it goes both ways. Yes, if you love a site, please don't block the ads on that yeah. site because otherwise the site goes away. However, if you create content and you are loading your site up with 50 really annoying ads, then you deserve to be blocked and you, you deserve to go away. So. I have no more than three ads on any page. Yeah. I, so. I don't have Most any of them ads. have two, some one. Yeah, we'll figure. Yeah. Now, folks, we know that this was a lot of information and we're going to make it really easy. You just go to our show notes and we give you all the links. We give you the links for Raspbian. We give you the links for all the parts for the project. We give you the links to Pie Hole. We even give you step-by-step -step instructions, which is, as you saw from the video is really simple. You just type in one line and it runs the script and you're good to go. Yeah. But you can find all of that at our show notes page. And, and where is that, Mr. Twit TV programmer? That's at twit.tv slash kh. Yeah, just go there. Yeah, that's... All of the Know How episodes. Exactly. And uh, by the way, 355 of them. Not only will you find all of our episodes, not only will you find all of our show notes, but you'll also find something that's very important to us, and that is the subscribe link. If yes. you drop over to the page, you'll see a small drop down menu where you can get the audio version, the video version, or the high definition video version automatically into your device of choice. This is the best way to support know-how. If you want to continue seeing projects, if you want to continue seeing the show on the network, pass this link to your friends. Tell them about know-how. Tell them that we try to give geeks the knowledge they need to live in the modern world. Of course, also don't forget that you can find us on the social, specifically on Google+. Just go to Google+, look for know-how, ask to join up. Once you're in, you get access to almost 12,000 kitas. Those are our know-it-alls, the people who are in every stage of their maker journey. You can ask questions, you can answer questions, you can post pictures of your projects, maybe we'll show them off here on know-how. I think we'll hit 12,000 by the end of the year. I hope so. Oh, that's yeah. a goal. Yeah. I, I still remember when Brian and I made a big deal of it being over 9,000. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yes. That wasn't that long ago. Yeah, yeah, it's growing no fast. Figure. Also, that's not the only socials you're going to find us at. You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. And what about you? I'm at twitter.com slash P. Yeah, and uh, also we've got a third member of our crew. He's the guy who's doing all the switching. Uh, he says he's perpetually grumpy, but I think he's just in a post-rage phase. It, see, now this is what happens. He's just messing around with our buttons. Yeah. You're going to find him where, Alex, exactly? Behind the desk, pressing the buttons. Also at dot com. Twitter, dot com dot slash com. A N E L F three. Yeah, whatever. He, he likes to mute me. Yeah. Until next time, I am Father Robert Balliser. And I'm Patrick Delahanty. And now that you know how, go put it in your pie hole. <laughs> <laughs>